All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 23rd day of January in the year of our Lord, 2024. And we have sort of a uh, another sequel to Pope Francis's, um, what did he call that? Fiducia Supplicans, his December 18th. Uh, le- well, his, the organ grinder had his monkey turn out a paper called Fiducia Supplicans, which basically calls for the church to bless irregular unions of various types, including same-sex couples, trans couples, two priests, I suppose, would fit into that, too. Um, And most of Africa rejected that. But some bishops are are requiring their priests to give these kinds of blessings. Uh, It's interesting, the document calls for these blessings to be spontaneous and non-scripted, not sacramental, not to appear as if you're blessing a wedding ceremony or anything of the kind. So it has to be, uh, however, however, at St. Peter's in Rome, they are currently giving instructions in how to perform these blessings. So how can it be spontaneous if you have to be instructed in it? That is a little bit of a contradiction. This is, a, this is opening the door. This is unlocking the door to just about everything. So you can take this document that uh, uh, the monkey grinders monkey produced. Well, uh, the reason I say that is because the, he- the current head of the discastery for the Doctrines of the Faith, I think that's more or less the correct title. It used to be called the Inquisition. Uh, Ratzinger had that office before he became Pope. It's the office that's supposed to maintain sound doctrine in the Roman Catholic Church. So he cranked out this document. Uh, Well, previously he cranked out a couple semi-pornographic books, and apparently the Pope knew about it before, I think it was in September he was appointed to that office and elevated to the status of cardinal. So this is like the Pope's right-hand monkey. Monkey, because everybody calls him Tucho, Tucho. A Tucho is Spanish for monkey. So I just can't get that picture out of my head, the old-fashioned a monkey, uh, the uh, the organ grinder, the hand cranked organ, with a um, dancing monkey. Well, Francis has the opportunity. If things get too hot, he can always throw the monkey under the bus, or under the Pope mobile. Uh, see, the monkey produced it and it produced it in his name, but Francis signed off on it. So, so if it gets too hot, toss the monkey under the bus. Yeah, that sort of was a little suspicious. Okay, so this is like a door opening, though. So this is just stage one. It'll go on beyond this because Francis, well, his theology is, well, I don't want to get into that right now. It's not Christian. It's not Christian. He is a a universalist, more or less, or annihilationist. So if you're if you're just utterly opposed to Francis, you'll just be annihilated. Uh, somebody, what's it, Dr. Marshall? Um, what was his, what's his first name? Yeah, anyway, uh, he was a Episcopal priest that's converted to Roman Catholicism. He's not a priest now, but he's like a, a teacher, I think. Uh, anyway, he's on, uh, on Twitter X, whatever you call that thing now, X, Twitter, whatever. Uh, he put a tweet out the other day, and I responded 
to it. It said, uh, I can't remember what the subject was exactly. Uh, but it had to, I, 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 I'd probably misbehave on Twitter, I don't know. But I pointed out that the difference between, well, oh, I know what the thing was. He was insisting Roman Catholicism is Christianity. To be a Roman Catholic is to be a Christian. To be a Christian is to be a Roman Catholic. As most converts are, he's a dedicated Romanist. Outside the church, there is no salvation kind of guy. Definitely doesn't like Vatican II. Anyway, uh, I just responded to that. I said, no, to be a Roman Catholic, uh, to be a Christian is to be in communion with Jesus Christ. To be a Roman Catholic is to be in communion with Pope Francis. <laughs> that might have been a little bit of a low blow, but... It's true. It's true. Historically, you had to be in communion with the Pope to be a Christian, to be a member of the one true church. That was the standard, whereas Jesus says, it's, no, no, it has to do with him. And that's relevant uh, to what we're going to talk about. But anyway, he put out this paper, we're going to bless all this stuff. We're going to bless gay unions and everything else. We're going to do it right here in St. Peter's. So the Pachamama idolatry from 2019 wasn't enough. Now it's going to be this, and then it'll be sacramental too. Or, or maybe they'll just bless this irregular union and then give them communion. Mm. Which really isn't much worse than a priest consecrating the elements and then partaking of them when he's a homosexual, actively practicing that. Is there? I don't know. It's pretty bad. But anyway, the other day, apparently, yeah, maybe two days ago, a firestorm broke about a teacher named Alistair Begg, and he's from Parkside? Anyway, he's scheduled to be a teacher at this year's Shepherds Conference with uh, out there with uh, John MacArthur. And so they, they took, I thought Piper was pretty much retired, like off the scene and maybe in refrigeration someplace, I don't know. But uh, I see he's scheduled to be, uh, he's in the number two slot after John, which is, you know, these pictures are probably a few years dated. Anyway, Alistair Begg, which is the uh, teacher in question that stirred up a firestorm, uh, pastor at Parkside Church. Yeah, he's, he's uh, fairly regular at Shepherd's Conference. There are some people that used to be at Shepherd's Conference up to a few years ago, but then they went woke and they're not on the thing anymore. However, how long will it be before Grace Community Church goes woke? Not long. Uh, so we have this, uh, let's see, where is this here? Uh, this is uh, Bible Thumping Wingnut, BTWN News. Uh, okay, he is a real strong John MacArthur fanboy. And uh, he used to hang around with, uh, well, I can't remember his name now, which is just as well. <laughs> Nobody wants to remember his name anymore. Anyway, so he's he's generally very, uh, very keen on John MacArthur, like a disciple of John MacArthur. So he also has recommended Alistair Begg and listened to him for years. And so th he made this comment that just caused a firestorm in the uh, evangelical community, whatever that is. So let's, we're going to listen to it. I ha didn't really take the time to dig it up from uh, Alistair Begg's own website, which is Truth For Life. It's supposedly somewhere on there. And, uh, oh, here, yeah, this is it here. Um, he's supposed to be a good Bible teacher. So we're going to listen to this and see what all the fire is about. Uh, 
marks. So if you're here just to hear exactly what Alistair Begg said, that is going to come up real quick right here in the front. So Alistair Begg, Parkside Church, very solid evangelical pastor, one of the pastors that I would recommend before these comments, right along with Pastor John MacArthur, uh, a tremendous minister, been at Parkside Church for over 40 years. He took the senior pastor position in 1983, I believe. Been preaching very soundly for many years. That is why his, that's what makes his comments about LGBTQ weddings shocking. It is in another direction and learning to say, but I have no basis upon which I could argue that I w myself would not be where they are, were it not for the amazing grace of God, were it not for his compassion towards me. And in very specific areas, this comes up. Okay, well, let me say something. First of all, that the Alistair Begg and John MacArthur and Bible Thumping, Thumping Wingman, I can't remember his name, uh, at the moment, um, are all Calvinists. So when they say the grace of God, an amazing grace of God, they mean <laughs> election. Nevertheless, what he just said is true. What it, what, if it wasn't for the grace of God, I'd probably be physically dead right now because I was on that road. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but that's true. So that's true. And, and you might be surprised at my take on this. I might be surprised at my take on this, but I'm probably going to take a different route than those people. Cross, I mean, you and I know that we field questions all the time that go along the lines of, uh, my grandson is about to be married to a transgender person, and I don't know what to do about this, and I'm calling to ask you to tell me what to do, mm. which is a huge responsibility. And in a conversation like that just a few days ago, um, and uh, people may not like this answer, but I asked, the, I asked the grandmother, does your grandson understand your uh, belief in Jesus? Yes. Does your grandson understand that your belief in Jesus makes it such that you can't countenance uh, in any affirming way the choices that he has made in life? Yes. I said, well, then, okay, as long as he knows that, then I suggest that you do go to the ceremony, mm. and I suggest that you buy them a gift. Mm. Oh, she said, how, 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 what? She was caught off guard. I said, well, here's the thing. You, you're not going to, your, your love for them may catch them off guard, but your absence will simply reinforce the fact that they said these people are what I always thought, judgmental, critical, unprepared mm -hmm. to countenance anything. And it is a fancy, it is a fine line, isn't it? It really yeah. is. And people need to work out their own salvation with fear and trembling. But I think we're gonna take that risk. We're gonna to have to take that risk a lot more if we want to build bridges into the hearts and lives of those who don't understand Jesus and, and don't understand that he is a king. Okay. Um, hmm. <sighs> build bridges. All right. First of all, uh, he asks her, do, do they understand you don't countenance this relationship? So apparently he's marrying a transgender woman, which means it's really a homosexual relationship because a transgender woman is, if I understand it properly, <laughs> is a man who presents herself <laughs> as a woman uh, who regards herself mm, as a woman. <laughs> the, world, the world has gotten very difficult and confusing. All right, so, um, so if, now, if they understand that she does not countenance this, why is he asking her or suggesting that she demonstrates her countenance of it by attending their wedding. And this is the same issue with Francis and his uh, uh, his monkey's 
letter, uh, Fiducia Supplicans, and why there's a big firestorm there, that um, Roman Catholicism could actually schism over this. It already has schismed in many ways, which is why Francis may or may not throw the monkey, monkey under the bus. Uh, he has said in the past he's not afraid of schism. Well, uh, basically the church is really split on that one. So do you go with the world or you do go with Christ? That's the real issue here. So if the grandmother already said she doesn't countenance it, and, and he is suggesting that she attends the wedding and buys them a gift, isn't that countenancing it? That is affirming it. That's where all the conservative Catholics are having this issue with this, this letter that was put out, this decree put out by the dicastery for the doctrine of the faith. It's like, we're going to bless all kinds of arrangements. Why is it only two? Why not three? Why not five? What's to stop anything there? Why not? And one of the excuses that was given was, well, the church already blesses things and animals, you know, the Francis thing, or uh, Francis of Assisi, you know, bless, bless your farm, your, your donkey, and probably get your tractor blessed and whatever else. Uh, it's not quite the same thing. Those aren't moral issues. Those aren't, your donkey's not going to go to hell for being a good donkey, nor is your tractor going to go to hell for, for functioning well or functioning poorly. I mean, uh, do, be, do broken John Deere tractors go to hell? I don't think so. Well, they go to destruction. They go, they go to the scrapyard, get melted down and reused. Uh, but they're not, they don't have a moral thing unless they get carried away with the AI they're probably putting in them now. Oh, no, my tractor had an emotional breakdown and just destroyed our house deliberately. <laughs> I suggest you don't. <laughs> they could get carried away with this AI stuff really easy. Yeah. Like, like I think I gave that example of the, they were doing drone research with AI, and they had a problem because the AI, because it had a, would been taught to fulfill the mission, uh, when the operators who had the final uh, say, you know, they could abort the mission, uh, started to abort the missions, the, uh, the, 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 this was all, this wasn't a real drone, this was all computer simulated. So in the simulation, the, the drones began to circle back and attack the operators so they could complete the mission. <laughs> Probably an indication you should be careful at what you do with AI especially in weapon systems or in cars or in cars. That's like basically a self-driving car has to use AI. This has got AI in it because there's no way you could could do a conventional program and, and drive a vehicle. No, it has to be. It's a very complex task and you have to need, some, need something like intelligence of, of a site of sorts. Now, this is not an intelligence beyond what your dog has, but nevertheless, it has a capacity greater than it. It's not living. It's a th it's a dead thing. Okay, so um, this situation here, uh, because you, you have this thing that's going on in Rome right now, and of course it's this is as, as Rome goes, so goes the world. Uh, so this this has been going on for a long time, and and a lot of Christians were saying, well, at least Rome's holding the line. No, they're not. Not with Francis. No, they're they're surrendering. So. Uh, or schisming, um, you know, just had the schism in the among the Methodists, the disunited Methodists now. Uh, so this this issue with Beg here, uh, this is a difficult issue. I'm not gonna. There's not a simple answer to it, but th his telling the grandmother that that sh they already know that she doesn't countenance it. So you're gonna go to a public ceremony and present yourself there and give them a gift. That is countenancing it, as the conservative Catholics are all up in arms about. And I'm talking about bishops and archbishops and cardinals up in arms about that. Uh, and Francis calling Francis a heretic and an apostate and an antichrist and just about every other thing they can come up with. Rightly so. 
So there's a problem when you lose sight of your loyalties. Why did Jesus say, you, well, we're going to look at Jesus' word and how this has to work out. But so you have a situation like this. She loves her grandson who is in this relationship, who is going to get married to a man who thinks he's a woman. Oh, that just to think about that is offensive. I mean, I, I don't want to put myself in that position. It's like, no, that's not going to work. Um, and, I mean, for a Christian, this is, this is where the, what we're being facing, though. The whole world, the whole Western world, not the Eastern world, not Russia, not Africa, not the Muslim world. Now, this is something, too. All these people that are deathly afraid of uh, the the you know by, uh, the the globalists and the WEF and all this globalist conspiracy. Did you ever think how are they going to get the Muslims to go along with that? No, that's not going to work. There's something called Allah in the Quran that's going to be a big roadblock. Of course, maybe Iraq and Afghanistan were all part of that globalist plan to subordinate the Muslims to maybe Israel's part of it too. If they won't go along, we'll just have to genocide them. Yeah. Well, why is the United States the slave of Israel too? I can't figure out that. Well, I know why it is, but I don't want to say. It seems that Netanyahu has uh, Biden on a dog chain on a, one of those collars Netanyahu, ah, we got too much trouble over here. Biden, you got to help us out with the with Yemen down there that are blockading our ships. And in by the way, Yemen is actually fulfilling international law by doing that because Israel's involved in blatant genocide, and there's a genocide treaty that requires countries do what they can to prevent that. So uh, Yemen is actually acting lawfully in operating a maritime embargo against the state of Israel, in case you didn't know that. Well, you probably didn't because you're not going to hear it on American media or from Joey, uh, the good Catholic. <laughs> okay, so uh, apparently genocide's not a mortal sin or something. I don't know because the United States is in full partnership with it. But back to this issue. So how do you you're in a quandary. You uh, quandary. You you love someone, but they're doing something that you that you can't countenance at all. You can't do it. So what do you do? Well, the way uh, Beg suggests is well, surprise them with affection. It's like publicly. Build bridges. Ugh. It's going to take more than a bridge. It's going to take the conviction of the Holy Spirit to to act on this. Uh, this is... Why not pray for them? How about that? You can show... It's, it's the same way with a child or whatever, uh, an older child. If, if, if they're involved in something that is manifestly contrary to being a Christian, especially if they have made a claim of being a Christian. Uh, well, you, you, Jesus had the, uh, told the parable of the, the, uh, the two sons, uh, the prodigal and the older son, and the prodigal, uh, the, the father let him go. He let him go do what he wanted to do, and basically regarded him as dad until he was overjoyed to see him return. That was, that was it. Oh, you're, you're talking to the, the elder son. Your son, your brother was dead, but now he's alive. He repented. So he was dead to God until he came back home to where he belongs. 
but as long as he was in the far country, he was basically dead. He was dead in trespasses and sins. I don't think Alistair Begg is—, is See, there, there's subconscious pressures, and a pastor especially should be aware of this. So the world is pushing us one way. Your congregation is going to go, want to go with the world. There, there, there's a, the cultural force. You're, you're out there like you're standing in the river, and the river is in flood stage. And it's pushing you. It wants to push you downstream with it. And you have to stand against that. You have to to hold your ground in the middle of that thing. All the world is against you. Cult, see, it used to be in the United States. When I was younger, although it was beginning to shift because it was the 1960s, I mean, yeah, uh, a lot of this stuff goes back to the beginning of the 1960s. But the culture, like, uh, divorce was frowned on. It was you know, something you didn't brag about. You didn't, divorce. I mean, there was no... In small-town America or you know, small cities and things like that, you didn't have public homosexuality. You didn't have—public uh, drunkenness was bad. I mean, it, it was—there was plenty of sin going on. It just wasn't open, and it wasn't—it was frowned on. The culture did not approve of it, like even didn't even approve of divorce. So there was social pressure not to do these things. And if you did it, you better keep it hidden in your own house. Uh, but that doesn't exist now. Now the pressure is the other way. I was just checking the stats earlier because uh, I, I was wondering, is this, is like the transgenderism racially related? Is it a disease of, uh, is it disease, quote unquote, an affliction of privileged white people? No, it's not. Interestingly, at least there was a survey done in 2016 that demonstrated that actually what they call whites were less apt to, slightly less apt to be transgender than African Americans or Asians or Hispanics. I think Hispanics and was and African Americans were a little higher than the. So, quote unquote, white Americans. Uh, well, how come they? How come they get a location race and we get a color race? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, because they don't break it down to Norwegian slash Germans. I'm not sure I want to identify with, especially the Germans. Uh, they've gone nuts. Well, they've all gone nuts now. Europe has gone nuts. But I, the, so that was interesting. What I did actually, I did it to verify because I heard something else that transgenders have an attempted suicide rate of forty percent from legitimate studies, forty percent, and 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 eighty to eighty-five percent have considered suicide. So this we're talking about something that's a real issue. Uh, well, it's a bondage. It's a sinful bondage that's self-destructive. And I can understand why they, they attempt to commit suicide, because what you're really talking about is a loss of identity. You don't have an identity. You don't know what you are. You don't know why you are. You have no... You know, the great philosophical questions, you have no answers, whereas a Christian has answers to all of them like that. I mean, all you have to do is read the first couple chapters of Genesis. You know why you're here. You know your purpose. You know who you're supposed to be, what you're supposed to be. Uh, but they don't. This whole culture has lost their identity. This is a manifestation, not just of sin, but of, uh, see, we have... We're living at the end of the age. This is, these are the last of the last days. What's happening in culture is, uh, well, Romans chapter 1, but the manifestation of it is occurring in all kinds of different ways. And it's, it's come to the point 
now that it is not even a, a rejection of Christ, but rejection of, of creation itself. It is the spirit of lawlessness that is amped up to the, the, the end times level where uh, young people, and it's, by the way, this has really gone up in the last few years, uh, the, the rate among 13 to 17-year-old uh, in the last survey I saw was of transgenderism was three times the rate of those 18 and older. And when you get over 65, it's like <laughs> almost nothing. So it's like 0.5% over 18, but the rate uh, less than that was like 1.5, and this was globally, more or less, I believe. Uh, but uh, it, today it might be even higher. I saw numbers as high as 3%. But some of this might be a fad, I mean. But nevertheless, there is, culture is an important factor in shaping people's attitudes and beliefs, including religious beliefs. But it's not an exclusive factor. <laughs> Let's put it that way. All right, so this is a difficult thing. So what are Christians supposed to do? Well, God desires that all people be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. But you don't bring people to Christ by befriending them and building bridges. That's not what the apostles did. They preached the gospel. They preached the true gospel. Nobody is saved by friendship. They're saved through the gospel. As Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. To everyone who believes it. It's the power of God. Now, Begg's a Calvinist. He doesn't believe that. I don't think. He probably holds to limited atonement and you're saved by election and things you don't, that, that preachers really don't want to talk about too much. Nevertheless, so, the, the, so this, this issue comes up, what do we do? Uh, is it, would Begg's response, would that grandmother be sinning? Uh, because he does clarify, does he know you don't approve of it? No, I don't think so, but would she be sending? Would she be? See, he she did. He didn't ask the right uh, question. There's first of all, her grandson is not a Christian. He is living in something that indicates that you are not saved. If you are in a relationship like this, it is manifest evidence you are not saved. You cannot live in an adulterous relationship or or a, a, this, this, these kinds of relationships, or living as a thief or a murderer or an embezzler, practice these things, lifestyle sins. You, if you're doing that, it is manifest evidence that you are not saved. Okay, so should we, we be particular? Th this is like sinner sensitive stuff. If Should we be that concerned about offending people that are in rebellion against God? I don't think so. But nevertheless, God desires that all men be saved. What he should have asked, would it offend you to go to the wedding and to give them a gift? And I suspect she would have said, yes, it would. Then don't go. Because you're violating your own conscience. Yeah, so what could you do uh, without violating your conscience. So first of all, you don't do it publicly. If you want to, to, uh, uh, to, because of the love of Christ for saving the lost, you don't do something that gives public approval. You would do it privately. You know, I was like, oh, how would I d deal with this? And like, I, okay, I, God wants to save them. But I, first of all, I pray. I pray. God, give me wisdom. And I don't violate God's word. I mean, you could invite them to come over for supper.
without affirming their relationship. And then maybe give them a gentle lecture on the gospel, how God desires to save sinners, and what the new covenant in is, how God will deliver you from bondage. Will they want to attend? Probably not. But you can invite them. You can come over for a cup of coffee or I'll fix you a nice meal, and I'd like to talk to you about the gospel of Jesus Christ and how God saves sinners. See, there's ways you can do things without compromising your conscience or compromising the gospel. But the world's not going to approve of that. Uh, and that's, but Beg, he is, he seems to be being blown by the winds of this world. And we can all suffer that at times. Uh, we can even, because we can't focus on the entire scripture at once, for one thing, we might read a passage and we see the love of Christ in there for the lost, and, and so our heart goes out to them. And yeah, you know, when I think about the homeless, my heart goes out to them. But I also know the homeless that really there's, there's you have to, there's fleshly compassion, and that can be sinful. If it, if it, uh, if your, if your lo love can be sinful, human love can be sinful. And that's one of the important things, and I want to talk about that. So let's go over to the scriptures and look at what Jesus says here. And these are a couple of scriptures that came to mind because this is about family and relationships and what Jesus says about this. And, of course, there's people that say out there that I did a video on this that Christianity is a religion, not a relationship. Ha! Well, that's only said by people that don't really believe the Bible or read it. Okay, this is the New King James. This is Matthew chapter 10, starting at verse 32. Looking at my time here. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. This is an issue of confessing Jesus before men. Uh, it can be. Again, this is a difficult thing because that's why I say that not going to a public ceremony that's celebrating this and coming back with something else like inviting them to a private meal in your house, that's different. One, you can do it good conscience. The other, you can't probably. Uh, so if you want to do something, if you want to reach out to them with the love of Christ, you probably don't want to do it in a way that affirms their sinful relationship, because Christ does not affirm that relationship. That relationship demonstrates they need salvation, and you have to approach it like that. Not that it's a worse sin than any other sin, I mean, they're cut off. They're obviously in a state of being lost. <sighs> but he who denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. All you once saved, always saved people out there. No, if you deny Christ, if persistently deny him, if you divorce him, it's not just an incidental thing or like Peter under pressure. Yeah, we can cave. The flesh is weak. Uh, nevertheless, this is de deliberate denial. This is like divorce. You can't really accidentally divorce something unless you're somebody, unless you're a Muslim, I suppose. Then you just say the word, I divorce you. Or is that Jewish? I divorce you three times. I can't remember which one is it. About the same on, on both. Uh, he who denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think, verse 34, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. There's a whole lot of pastors out there that don't believe this. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the, uh, those of his own household. Why? Because Christ divides. 
between those who believe in him, those who belong to him, and those who don't. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. But he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Yeah, all you people with a, trying to find your identity... He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. All right. Let's go to another scripture. Jesus, this isn't the same. Um, he's not say, he's talking to the same group here. So this is a similar message, though. Now great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them. So he's being followed by a, a mob, great multitude. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father or mother and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. So there was a great group of people that was following him. A disciple is one who follows. And he turns to them and says that. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. He does, who does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. What's he saying? That you are supposed to hate these people? No, it's a comparative. In, 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 the, in the comparison between your love for your, your family and your love for me must be like hate compared to love. See, the love that God gives us for Christ is supernatural, and he pours it out in us. And as Jesus said in the other one, you, you have to be willing to lose your life to follow him. If you're trying to hold on to your stuff, you can't follow Christ. Uh, sooner or later, what will happen is, like this grandmother, there's a decision. Do you love me, Christ, or do you love your grandson? Because you might be in a situation where you can't do both and must choose Christ or something else. In a world where it's completely, uh, increasingly pagan, this will become increasingly common. Where the world demands one thing, Christ demands something else. And if we don't love Christ more than we love the world, well, we will deny Christ and follow the world. We will not take up our cross and follow him. You have to love him more than your own life to be willing to do that. Correct? Because taking up your cross means going up that hill and dying. An ugly death. It doesn't mean suffering something. No, that's not a cross. A cross is a nasty instrument of execution. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not uh, sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Lest after he's laid the foundation is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him. I've seen a lot of houses like that down in the Texas border where people have begun to build a house and were not able to finish it. Years later, the, 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 the lumber is beginning to turn gray. And it's just like, yeah, they started years ago, but didn't finish it. Saying, this man has uh, mocked him, saying, this man has begun to build and is and is not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king does not first sit down and consider whether he's able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and acts, asks the terms of peace. So likewise, 
Whoever of you who does not fake, forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Again, at this time, of course, they actually were physically following him. So he had to physically leave it all behind. But yeah, if, it's a, if it comes to a choice between your possessions, your family, or anything else, and Christ, is Christ more important to you than the rest? And sooner or later, that'll probably come along in one way or another. Are you going to compromise your relationship with Christ in order to save relationships with your grandson? Or are you going to hold to Christ and pray for your grandson? That's the difference. Uh, salt is good, but if the salt has lost its flavor... How shall it be seasoned? Can't be. That means the salt is washed out of it. It is neither fit for the land or for the dunghill, but men throw it out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. If you're going to be of any value as a Christian, you have to love Christ more than everything else. You have to be his disciple. If you're not a disciple, I mean, this world is filled with people that call themselves Christians, but when they're put to the test, what's going to happen? In the last days, we're going to be put to the test. We're always put to the test. But didn't you realize this back in 2015 when the Supreme Court went that way? That there'd be a whole lot of Christians that weren't going to pass the test. They weren't going to stay faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. Or to his mission. See, if, if we compromise with the world, if we comfort the world in their sin, and rebellion against God. We are not serving Christ. The devil will tell us that we are. He'll tell us the way to, to, to win the world is to comfort the world in their rebellion, to be nice to the world, to be pleasing to the world, to cater to the world. But what God needs to do is confront the world with their sinfulness. And anything you do, and that's what the Holy Spirit is here to do, to convict the world of their sin, of the coming judgment, and of the righteousness that God requires. And if you blunt that in order to protect the feelings of sinful people, you are serving Satan and could be instrumental in damning them. Now, if you're a Calvinist, well, it's all determined by election, so it doesn't really matter what you do. And Begg is a Calvinist. So I don't think he's a reliable source when it comes to this. But you can be a solid Bible teacher and be lost. You can be a solid Bible teacher and not be loyal to Christ. See, Jesus is talking about loyalty here. Faithfulness. See, the word faith, pistis, also means faithfulness. You can't separate those two meanings. So what God wants is not simply an intellectual consent to the gospel or a theological knowledge. He wants people that are committed to him, who love him. And he is number one in their heart. And that is a result of being born again. That's a result of God's work in us. But this is a difficult situation. And again, what I would suggest, what, what I would do if I was in my right mind, if I wasn't just filled with anger, but grandma's always, well, grandmas are always a soft touch anyway, but is something like that, is to privately display uh, concern and let them know about God's love for sinners. and do it in a, a private way so you're not violating your conscience and you're not giving public approval to what God says will, a lifestyle that will send you to hell. But you have to confront them with that. Say, this lifestyle demonstrates that you're not saved, you don't belong to Jesus, you're, you're lost. And lost people end up in a bad place. But God doesn't want you there. He wants you to be saved. And, and so, you know, then, then explain to them what real salvation is. And do it out of a heart of concern with maybe a tear in your eye. 
Yeah, that's what I would suggest. Because that's God's attitude. 